good is good enough. Okay, so I'm basically going to sort of um, continue this discussion of renormalization, regularization, all of that stuff, and kind of show you where it eventually goes. And I know that to start with, there might be a little bit of like, oh, that's weird, you know, the electric charge isn't constant, you know, what the electric charge is depends on the momentum with which you're probing it or whatever, but um, uh, where we will eventually take it, though, is going to be a little bit more intuitive, in a sense. I'll give you plenty of examples of this intuitive uh, thing. Um, but anyway, um, so just a very quick uh, reminder, first of all, um, if we if we are looking at a scattering process of an electron and a muon, um, then we can you know do all of these diagrams, and in all of them, when we're calculating the contributions to m, we would use the fundamental value of the electric charge or the electric coupling. Okay, um, but uh, do remember that certain diagrams like this one right here, they can give you contributions to the amplitude which are going to diverge. Um, so, um, well, you know, that's, that's a bit of a problem, and we'll talk more about that today. Um, but a, a better way to handle this is actually to say, well, screw that, you know, if the coupling changes with the scale, and I actually use the coupling value at the momentum on which I'm probing this process, then I can actually just use that value in this diagram and get the answer. I don't need to do all the loops because all of the loops are actually contributing to this value, okay? Now we're gonna take that story and go quite a bit further with it, but I just wanna show you um, a couple of relations. First of all, um, yeah, there we go. So we have gr q squared is defined, or it is given by ge times the square root where this is the fundamental and this is the renormalized value at the, the momentum scale Q, one minus GE squared over 12 pi squared times LN. And of course, this is for this particular process, so this is not a general result that I'm giving you, um, times the cutoff scale, the cutoff, uh, uh, so we have an integral and we're basically um, putting a cutoff into it to make it finite and then, you know, if you take that cutoff to infinity then it obviously gets to uh, you know, infinite value. Uh, but we're going to talk about that in due time. Minus F minus Q squared over ME squared C squared, uh, yes, plus other contributions. This is just this first uh, it's a fourth order contribution, but it's the first non-tree level contribution. And then you can just play the story out with other contributions as well. Um, now this is GRQ squared written in terms of GE, GE. That's the fundamental value. Notice if I take MC to infinity, this is gonna blow up. But our argument is, well, yeah, this is blowing up, but I don't know what this is. I don't know the fundamental value of the electron charge and I can't measure it because the measure that I have to get beyond infinite time and get right up to it. Face it, yeah. and I can't, you know. So what we do is we just say, okay, well this could go to whatever it needs to so that it cancels that and we get a finite answer because this is actually our measurement and our measurement is not infinity, our measurement's a finite value. Okay, that makes sense? Now, um, bear in mind, and I brought this up last time, if this value of the electric coupling which is dependent on momentum, if this is a function of momentum, then what is it that's in the book? Because there's a value for the electric charge in the book. Like, what is it? So it turns out that that is essentially GR0. That is basically if you're doing an experiment where you're just tapping on it. And I mean, actually, this could just be something, you know, at a distance of a few centimeters. That's basically zero momentum transfer. So. There's energy scales and they're inversely proportional to, to length. So large length is low energy, small length is high energy. So if I'm basically working at a few centimeters or basically zero momentum transfer, then this is just gonna have a value because that's zero. That value turns out to be GE times the square root of, well, this function of Q is zero if Q is zero. So it's gonna be one minus GE squared over 12 pi squared 
ln mc squared over mp squared. Okay? And then what we can do is we can say, okay, well, actually, let me just express gr squared in terms of g, or grq squared in terms of this gr0. And in that case, we're going to get something like the following. about this, um, this is not something that we're going to work with, but just what I want to point out is the following. If we're doing this calculation and we use this, or sorry, we try and do it in terms of GE, then we're going to get this explosive term. Okay, it goes to infinity. And we're going to use our, just basically we shouldn't do that. We should not do the calculation and assume that this value GE is the one that we measure, because it's not. So what we can do is, or sorry, I, I, I don't actually have this up here. Um, I can just say GE, that's the value, okay? So what we can do is we can actually use um, this value. And again, if you use this value, then the, the, the entire answer is given by that one diagram, okay? However, you have to know the value of the coupling that you're at the scale you're measuring. So what we'll often do is we'll say, okay, no, I'm gonna look it up at a book, and that's this, this value. And then I can do my calculation at non-zero Q using this expressed in terms of this, okay? However, if I'm gonna use this value, I'm gonna get all of these diagrams. Okay, it's only if I'm using the GR, sorry, if I'm using this value. If I'm using GRQ squared, then I can use this. If I'm using GR0, then I'm going to have all of these diagrams. However, there's one big difference. If I use GR0, the contributions will not diverge. Okay? So my point just is, if you're trying to do your calculation with this, you're going to get these infinities. If you want to use this, you don't get infinities, and you just use that. If you use this, you don't get infinities, but you have to do all the diagrams. You don't have to do them all. The first year are going to be the main contributors. Okay? So um, I just I just want to point out, you know, it's it's not a simple like, oh, the electric charge is this, put that into the calculation and you're done. No, this is this whole running idea, and then it's going to play out in due time. Um, okay, yeah, let's get that. All right. So. Um, was I took basically the, the integral over Q um, and it runs from zero to infinity and I basically I put a cutoff in it, okay? So I basically said, well, instead of letting that go to infinity, I'll just let it go to some lambda cutoff and then that will basically render the answer finite, okay? But then you're always gonna have that lambda pop up in your answer and you know if you take lambda to infinity, that's gonna make the whole thing go infinite, okay? Now I'm gonna tell you the story about renormalization. All right, so, um, so there's various ways to sort of encode this infinity. One is just to put a cutoff on the momentum. Another one is called the poly Villars method. And in the poly Villars method, what we do is we basically, we take a one over, uh, well, let me think. Uh, yeah, so, um, we'll replace the integral of dq with this term, minus m twiddle squared c squared over q k squared minus m twiddle squared c squared. Okay? And what this is gonna do, so this is actually something which, and the limit that m goes to infinity is just one. Okay? But if I put this in, what it does is it increases increases the power of Q in the denominator. And that can take these divergent integrals and render them finite, okay? So this is yet another option for what we call regularization. That is, we're just gonna take this divergent thing and we want to put something in it, which is, which is gonna make it finite. Here it's a cutoff, here it's this mass term, okay? 
And then we can kind of see what's finite, what's going to go to infinity if we restore whatever the infinite limit is. There's yet another one, which is called dimensional regularization. And that is we let d go to d plus epsilon, where d is the dimension of our space time. Okay? So it turns out that if you take many of these processes, which are formulated in three plus one dimensions, and you instead formulate them in three plus one plus epsilon, where epsilon is just a small number, if you change the number of dimensions in the space time, you can render these things finite. And then the limit epsilon goes to zero restores the infinities. So these are, it's just a myriad of different ways of addressing the infinities that are arising, okay? All of these are called regularization. Now here's the important part, and you, sorry, you can apply regularization to any infinite result. That's not the important part of the story. Here's the important part of the story, okay? If, if when we regularize our theory and we, for example, look at the physical values of the mass and the coupling, okay, I've been talking about the coupling being renormalized, but the masses will also be renormalized. I'll show you that in just a minute. If the values end up becoming, and I'm just going to talk about poly Villars for a moment, end up becoming plus delta m, which is a function of m twiddle, plus delta g, which is a function of m twiddle, okay? Then what we can say is the following. Um, these were the inputs in our original theory. But what we actually physically measure are the MP and the GP, okay? So what we basically got is we've got this complicated story just basically breaking up into the initial values plus the contributions due to this master, all right? So we know that these are finite, all right? So once again, this could be infinite, and it could cancel the minus infinity from that, all right? If the story breaks up like this, okay? If the story breaks up like this, then the theory is called renormalizable. You're not guaranteed that if you regularize a theory that the result is going to take this form. If it does, then we can always say, well, this is the thing that's going to infinity. This is the unknown. So this can always be adjusted to cancel the infinity to explain these finite answers. Okay. But this breaking up in terms of the bare and the renormalized value, this is not always guaranteed. If the theory does not admit this, then it's called non-renormalizable, okay? And it's a problematic theory because effectively it's going to infinity and there's nothing you can do to cancel it, okay? Well, this should lead you to ask the question, is the standard model renormalizable? Sergio. Yes, it is, okay? <laughs> I think it was uh, Gerard de Hooft demonstrated that the standard model is renormalizable. Jeff, what's not? The standard model is quantum field theory. It's just, it's quantum field theory based on the symmetry groups SU3 plus SU2 plus U1 with the matter of the standard model, all that stuff. What do you think is not renormalizable? What do you think has these infinities that we can't get rid of? 
actually. It is gravity. Exactly. Quantum gravity is not renormalized. Okay. So you've probably heard, you know, when you quantize gravity, ship breaks. This is exactly what we mean. Quantum gravity is giving rise to these infinities that you just you, you can't you can't get rid of in the same way. So the thing is, there's infinities that are popping up all over quantum field theory. However, we've given them a nice explanation. We've just realized we're using fundamental values that we don't actually know and we can't know. So we should really just work with these, which are finite, and you just have an infinity canceling an infinity, okay? However, with quantum gravity, that is not the case. So quantum gravity is broken. I mean, gravity is fine, but quantum gravity is broken. So we're gonna have to fix it, and we're gonna get there towards the end of this lecture, okay? But for now, it just looks broken. Okay, so um, all right. Well, let me let me flash up a technical uh, feature, which is just it's just an anecdote, but I want to just be really quick with it. Um, you might wonder, is this the only fourth order diagram? And the answer is no. There's actually several other diagrams that have four interaction vertices. Okay, and those happen to be. Where in all of these I have electron, electron, muon, muon. So those are the additional fourth order diagrams here. I could put the things down here, but that's not gonna play an important role, okay? Just let me count them. There's one, two, four, there's one, two, three, four vertices on all of them. It's all Q, it's all QED, by the way. There's no strong interactions, weak interactions in this story. Um, and it turns out that these two um, are basically electron self-energy corrections. That is, they're basically just, I have an electron moving along and it emits and absorbs a photon. That's what's happening here. It's not really important that it's gonna be colliding with this muon and bouncing off and all that shit. This is just the electrons moving and this is, these are what are called self-energy corrections. And then this is what is called the vertex or the magnetic moment correction, which is a vertex correction if you will. About it, this is basically taking that vertex and replacing it with this triangular vertex. Go ahead. In the last one, is this the same photon that it's absorbing? Or in this sorry, in, the, in this one? No, sorry, in the previous one. Is it the same photon that's, that it's emitting and then reabsorbing? Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is a diagram that's allowed. I mean, this is the vertex. The same particle goes in, the same particle goes out, same. It, it's, an allowed, it's an allowed thing, okay? Now, um, now, these, it turns out, are finite. So they don't play a role in renormalization. Finite diagrams are not gonna play a role in renormalization. These, though, are gonna play a role in renormalization. They are all going to play a role. These three are all going to play a role in the electron charge renormalization. Okay? That's GE. But here's the important observation. These contributions, which are going to cause the electron charge to renormalize to different values depending on the Q scale, they're gonna depend on the mass of the electron. Just, just take my word for it. They're gonna depend on the mass of the electron. Now here's the important observation. That means that the muon, the normal, renormalized charge is gonna depend on the muon mass. And similarly, the tau line is gonna depend on the tau line mass. And here's my question. Are these three masses the same? No. 
So are these three charges the same? They are actually. <laughs> but that's what's weird. Look, the electron, the muon, and the tauon all have the same charge. If you're, if you're doing an experiment at zero momentum, they all have the same charge. If you're doing an experiment at the same momentum, they're all gonna have the same value. But they all have different masses. Can anybody guess what the hell is happening? Anna. Well, let me just ask you this. These contributions are going to depend on these masses. So they're going to be a function of the mass squared. Okay, and I, I guess I should put, there's three of them. So if there are functions of mass squared, but you gotta get the same answer for any mass, what is the sum? Three. What function of masses won't change if you change the mass? Will this change? Will this change? Yes, that will. Okay, what about that? What about that? Yeah, these three diagrams actually cancel each other out. Okay? In terms of the renormalization of the electron charge. Therefore, the electron, the muon, and the tauon are not going to get these mass dependent. So this is actually just a quick question following through with the AI question. Um, is there some sort of fundamental symmetry principle that we know of yet that determines that we know uh, that, that it always has to cancel out? Uh, nope, not that I'm aware of. Okay. Yeah. Okay, um, let me actually, all right, so, um, all right, now, Well, no, no, sorry, no. This is an index over which diagram? Three diagrams. Yeah. And I'm just saying if I add all three contributions together, I'm going to get zero. They're going to cancel. Any one of them will depend on the mass, and it'll be different for electrons, muons, talons. But the fact that all three of them add to, <coughs> add to zero makes the result independent of the mass. Okay? So then do you get the same summation, but it was G mu, so it would still be zero? Right. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's the self energy curve. Okay. All right, so now how come we're going to make this a little bit more intuitive in due time? I'm probably going to regret having erased what I just erased, but anyway. Um, but let me say a bit more about renormalization, and then we will sort of shift our attention to something which is a little more intentionally more. <coughs> Okay, um, so first of all, uh, notice if, we, if we're doing this, then we get the, and now I'm gonna switch back to alpha instead of GE, but it's, it's no different. Um, if I'm taking this diagram into account, so if I'm just going to fourth order, then what I find is that alpha Uh, is alpha zero one plus alpha zero three pi ln e squared over m a squared c squared. Okay. And um, 
it in this is interesting. It turns out that um, to all orders, this thing actually ends up being a geometric sequence. Okay, so this is the first order correction, but then I can do the next order correction. You know, I can do. And it turns out that you can do the summation, and the summation of this ends up being It's interesting. Well, first of all, um, hmm. first of all, if Q increases, and here I've got Q squared is much larger than MA squared C squared. If Q squared increases, what happens to this coupling? Q squared goes up, what happens to alpha? That's basically the coupling. It goes up, right? If this gets bigger, this is getting bigger, this is subtracting, okay? So this is going to increase, all right? Now, we're, we're gonna do a, a different story in just a moment. Um, however, notice that there is an interesting value of Q squared. If I take ln Q squared, <coughs> over m e squared c squared, and I set that equal to 3 pi over alpha 0, where alpha 0 is once again the coupling that we measure at zero momentum, it's the one that's in books, okay? What happens to this coupling? It blows up to infinity, okay? So we should really ask, what value of q does this correspond to? So we're never doing experiments at that energy level, okay? So even though there's an infinity, and we're gonna come back and address these infinities in just a second, even though there is an unavoidable infinity, we, we don't have to worry about it in terms of the energy levels that we're using at the accelerators. Now, um, what's interesting is if we now take this story and we say, well, what about in QCD? Okay, in QCD, so I did just a, just a reminder, so this is QED. As Q increases, so too does basically the electron charge. Okay, that's the result from QED. QCD, it's more interesting. In QCD, what we can do is we can first of all say, all right, fine. Um, we're gonna have, we're gonna have diagrams for a quark interacting with another quark in terms of the exchange of a gluon, and this is gonna be corrected by diagrams of this form, where this is a quark, and this is a quark, and they're moving in opposite directions, obviously. Okay, plus higher order diagrams. And the important thing is that this just like the QED result leads to screening. Okay, and just, just in order for you to appreciate that this means you're screening, I don't know if you remember, but when I did that classical fairy tale and I drew the, the dipole, you know, the dipole uh, stuff and I had the charge in there, we noticed that if we, went, if we went in with higher energy and got closer, the charge actually increased. That's what we call screening, okay? So this leads to screening. This also leads to screening. However, there are more diagrams in QCD than there are in QED, remember? Because you've got the gluons interacting with the gluons. So um, 
If we add in diagrams of, say, this form to the same process, Uh, and this one, and this one. Oops. Okay. Turns out these lead to anti screening. So if you have anti-screening only, don't worry about the screening right now, if you have only anti-screening, then if Q gets larger, then the charge gets smaller. It's the opposite of this result. Okay? So for QCD, we have Screening and anti-screening. Of course, all of these diagrams are part of the expansion of this process. So the question is, which wins? In the end, does it screen or does it anti-screen? Because in the end, you can't actually say, well, this is the one that was happening, therefore it was anti-screening. No, that's not the way this works. You do all of these diagrams, and you take the sum, and it gives you the answer for physically what you would observe. You don't observe particular virtual phenomena. It's just the sum over everything, okay? So right now, we've got to figure out which is going to win, screening or anti-screening, okay? So to figure out which is winning, basically, we're not going to do the calculation because doing this for QCD is horrendous because we've got to add in PD pop-off ghosts and all this other stuff, but what I'm just going to say is that the strong coupling at Q squared is the strong coupling at what I'm going to call mu squared, where mu is a reference scale. I can't say Me, because in this case, the only mass in the story was the electron mass. Here, I have got six quarks, okay? So I've got a range of masses. So I'm just gonna pick sort of a reference scale, but that's not gonna be that important. Here's the important part. One plus alpha s mu squared over 12 pi, 11n minus 2f times ln q squared over mu squared. Okay? Now I just want you to notice the similarity of these two results. Okay? This one led to screening. So now Sam is going to tell me what condition is going to tell me whether this is screening or anti-screening. The sum. Of which term? Of the mass of what? Or the measured of? So all of these things are sort of fixed in their signs. There's, however, one term in here which is not fixed in its sign, and it's this one. Okay. So if 11n minus 2f is greater than zero, what's the result? Screening or anti-screening? <laughs> well, if this is positive, then that's a plus, and it's just a plus plus. However, here it's negative. So for screening, it's negative. If this is positive, then this is anti-screening. If it's negative, then it's screening. Okay? Um. Hmm. Sorry, say it again. What are N and F? 
Well, that's what I'm about to tell you. <laughs> Sorry, that's what I'm about to tell you. So um, F is the number of flavors of cork. Okay, that's basically the number of different corks by name. Okay? N is the number of colors. We're doing this in general. We're saying we're going to have F number of corks and N as the SUN gauge symmetry. Okay? Now, now I can say, all right, fine. F is 6 and N is 3. In the standard model, there are six corks up, down, strings, turn up, top, bottom, and there are n equals three colors. Well, is that screening or anti screening? That would be anti screening. It's anti screening. Okay. <laughs> now, this is interesting because what this says is as I get, is if I probe quarks at a smaller and smaller scale, that is at a higher and higher energy, the quark charge actually goes to zero. That means that only at really, really high energies is the quark coupling less than one which means we can use perturbation theory. This is called the asymptotic freedom of quarks. And what's really interesting is quarks are always meant to be found in these bound states of hadrons. They're either mesons or baryons, pairs or triplets, okay? They're very, very close together. The quarks are super close together, but that means, according to this story, that their charge is very, very small. That way, for studying the interaction of quarks in these nuclei, you can use perturbation theory. However, if you pull the quarks apart, that's going to lower energies, their interactions just get larger and larger and larger. Does that explain quark confinement? Remember this idea that quarks have to live together? No, it does not. Why not? because this entire story is based on perturbation theory. This entire story only applies when the coupling is less than one. What I just learned is if I pull quarks apart, the coupling gets large. Therefore, I can't use perturbation theory anymore. It's suggestive, but it's not a proof of the confinement. Like I said, if you've got a proof of the confinement, just pack your bags, we'll go and get your Nobel Prize. Okay? All right? So it's interesting because it turns out if I apply this to the weak interactions, the weak interactions are also screened. So QED and the weak interactions are screened, but the QCD interaction is actually anti-screened. The higher energy you probe something with, the less it's going to interact. Yes? So for the alpha S of zero, is that still like the charge of quark that we know? So that's, that's kind of the weird thing, right? You can't really measure the charge of a quark. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you can't do that. You gotta infer from, from other measurements. Okay. All right, so um, what I wanna do now is, um, oh, and I guess I should say, uh, there is an interesting uh, avenue that theorists like to explore, which is the idea of pure QCD. And pure QCD is basically taking F to zero, that is removing all the matter and just keeping the quarks, I mean, sorry, the gluons, okay? And what's interesting about that idea is that it's actually a finite theory. There are no infinities, so you don't have to do any of this renormalization. You don't have to, okay? Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna make this idea a little bit more intuitive through what are often called effective field theories, okay? And um, so I'm gonna give you several examples of this, uh, and it's going to make use of this idea of renormalization, but we're not really gonna do any calculations with it, I'm just gonna kinda tell you a story, or two, or three, or four, five, maybe, but anyway. Okay, 
So effective field theories are in some sense what I just wrote down when I said, you know, I can take all of these diagrams and replace them by this one. Okay, if I'm willing to use GRT squared. Okay. This is an effective field theory using this as my coupling and it's much simpler to work with. Okay, but now I just kind of want to go over some more concrete examples of this. So it turns out that before we ever even knew about QCD, well before we knew about QCD, there was an offering for an explanation of the decay of a neutron. And this was due to Fermi. And what he had in mind was that the decay of a neutron occurred through a four-point interaction vertex like this, where coming out we had the anti-neutrino, the anti-electron neutrino, the electron, and the proton. So Fermi proposed that there was this interaction vertex, right? And this is obviously not a part of anything that we've done for the standard model. Okay, this, this is not a part of the story at all, period. These are all matter particles. There's no gauge boson mediating the interactions. But, he, but this was before we understood all that. So Fermi proposed this as, um, as a, a possible thing. Now what's interesting is if you take this and you're doing quantum field theory with this, you're just putting this as, in, in, as an interaction, um, you discover that the theory is non renormalizable Okay? Now, remember I said the standard model is renormalizable. So if we had done everything correctly, it would be renormalizable. But this version of it is non renormalizable. Now, um, well, remember, non renormalizable is really only a problem if you're taking things to infinity. Because, you know, you get, you, you have it depending on these certain parameters, and if you take this like the Q, the, the Q momentum. If the Q momentum goes to infinity, then this thing is going to blow up. Um, that's very really non-renormalizable, all right? Um, so, but we, we can kind of understand why this is happening through the following correct diagram. So remember, the way this actually works is something like the following. We have up, up, down, which is, of course, the neutron. And that's going to become an up, up, up. Proton, and this is going to occur by the emission of a W minus. Okay. So, in addition to the fact that these neutrons and protons get broken down into quarks, we don't really need to focus on that. What we really need to focus on is that there's a, a mediator. Yes, sir. So, um, no, actually, you might be right. You might be right. I might have it wrong. S Ross? Proton up, 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 or up? It's up, 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 down. It is up, up. So this is up, down, now. No, hold on. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's down, down, of course, half charge. I don't know why I wrote it in my notes wrong, but it doesn't matter. Okay, um, at any rate, there's just one quark that's, that's undergoing this. But at any rate, um, well, first of all, notice th th this, this is basically this diagram. I've just moved the P back over here. But this, you know, if you just step back and you squint it, this is a P and M and E and an electron neutrino, which is the same thing as here except this is being blown up with this exchange of a gauge boson, okay? So um, we can calculate things in each of these cases. So here we can say um, this is U bar N, 
gamma mu, one minus gamma five. Um, nope, sorry. I don't want to do that, I want to do this. I want to say this is u bar m gamma mu, one minus gamma five, u uh, proton minus i eta mu nu, minus q mu q nu over mw squared c squared over q squared minus mw squared c squared times v bar <coughs> neutrino gamma nu, one minus gamma five, Where I want you to notice that this is basically a vertex, a propagator, and a vertex. That is that. Okay? So this is just the basic con contribution to N that we would expect from this diagram. It's a weak interaction, so we don't have to mess with colors and PCD and all that. Okay? Now, um, if we take the momentum to be much smaller than the mass of the weak boson times C, which is pretty easy because this thing is hella large. So if you're doing experiments at low energy, there's a good chance the momentum transferred is much less than this. This is a hell of a lot, okay? Then this simplifies. much less than NW times C. This is just a constant. This is not really playing a role. So it turns out that this is describing what we might call a vertex vertex interaction. Okay? So what we've just discovered is that Fermi's proposal is actually accurate as long as the experimental scale is much, much smaller than this MW. Which is, I mean, back in the day of Fermi, that was pretty much the norm, okay? As we built accelerators at higher and higher energies, eventually we eclipsed this value, and this result no longer gave us the correct prediction. But that's fine, because we eventually developed this idea, had this as our contribution, and this gives us the correct answer. Okay? So, what you can say is, this is the correct field theory. This is the weak interactions with the standard model and all this garbage. Big boson mediated forces and all that stuff. However, if I'm going to take that story and I just want to play it out at small energies, it turns out we can replace this by this simpler story. This is an effective field theory. It gives you the answers in a certain range. Okay? Outside of that range, it doesn't give you the correct answers. Does this make sense? Okay, so I'll give you some other effective field theories. Um, turns out we've actually sort of happened upon this one. We were talking about the strong interactions. So, turns out in the strong interaction story, um, 
what ends up being an interesting simplified picture is that if I bring in a neutron or a proton, then I can generate an interaction vertex with a pi naught. Okay? Or, if I want to bring in a neutron or a proton and have come out a proton and a neutron, I can do it with pi plus or minus. Oops, this is converting protons into neutrons, so, vice versa. Okay? Now, um, this is an interesting idea. This means that um, I've got, you know, three gauge bosons. These are acting like gauge bosons. There are three of them. One's neutral, the other two are charged. These are actually not, so I just want to point out, these are actually not gauge bosons, these are particles. This is a particle, this is a particle, this is a particle. These are all particles. Just like in the Fermi case, these were all particles. There were no gauge bosons. However, if you look at that and you squint your eyes, it kind of looks like Q, Q what? It's actually the weak interaction. <laughs> it's the one that doesn't have a Q. It looks kind of like this. Okay? Well, what's the symmetry underlying this? This is the weak interaction. S. U. Three, two, two. SU2 has three generators. <laughs> so I could maybe write this as an SU2 gauge theory, okay? Where the SU2 acts on these doublets of neutrons and protons. Okay, so what I'm saying is the pi zero, the pi plus minus, those are the generators of this SU2. And they're two by two matrices, so they have to act on a doublet. And what they're acting on are the neutrons and the protons. Is this the standard model? No. I mean, what, what force are we talking about? We're talking about QCD, the strong interaction. That's an SU3 gauge. <laughs> and it doesn't have neutrons or protons in it. Okay. In fact, what does this story look like in the standard model? Well, we, I showed you. <laughs> it's, I'm not even going to draw it. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's this one. Where this is connected to this. <laughs> It's this garbage factor, okay? Actually, it's not that bad because in the end, we've got all of these connections, but we've only got two lines which emerge from each of them. This is the pi zero, or the pi plus or minus, okay? All right? So yet again, and you know, this could be a proton or a neutron. Um, and so too down here. So all I want you to see is that this is the super complicated fundamental theory. This is QCD with eight gluons, three different colors of quarks, okay? This is a hell of a lot simpler. All right? When do you think you can use this? Say it again. So, um, so I just, I, you know, I just want to show you how these effective field theories can crop up in various instances. Um, now, what, what, what does all this mean? You know, I kept telling you I'd give you an intuitive approach, and the intuitive approach was actually born in the 70s due to a guy named Kenneth Wilson. Wilson's approach to renormalization. Um, well, Wilson's approach is a more universal idea of how renormalization plays out. And the basic idea is the following. Um, 
If we have a non-renormalizable theory, that is with unrenewable infinities. So remember we, we had these problems in quantum gravity. We don't have them in the standard model, we have them in quantum gravity. If we have a non-renormalizable theory with infinities that you can't get rid of, After all, it turns out that if you take that Fermi, that Fermi story and you take it to high energies, you get infinities that won't go away. But that's what you expect because this is not good to higher and higher energies. Eventually, you're responsible for that. Okay? So, maybe it's the case that if a theory is non-renormalizable, good up to a certain level, and then it should be replaced by something which is more, which is actually, it should be replaced by something which is either renormalizable, okay, that's what we do when we go from the Fermi four-point interaction to the exchange. This is not renormalizable, this is renormalizable, okay? But better still, Maybe if something is not renormalizable and you take it up to a certain scale and it gets replaced by something else, maybe that something else is actually finite. Maybe there are no infinities in the story at all. That's, that's awesome. Because you don't have this fiddling around with like, well, you know, it, it's got infinities, but that's because everything's defined in terms of this fundamental thing, and we don't actually know the value, so we're just going to infinity to cancel infinity, which makes sense, but it's still kind of like, ah, where's what? But if this gets replaced by a theory where the answer is three, not three plus minus infinity, <laughs> that's way, way gooder, okay? Now, um, turning this around, and so, so, by the way, when we, when we do something like this, what we call this is the UV completion of the theory. That is, we're working with an effective field theory. It's only useful up to a certain energy scale. And then at that energy scale, which is what we call the UV, you should replace the theory with the more comprehensive one. Okay, so this is just called UV completion. It's just a name, it's not that important. Um, that's ultraviolet completion. Turning this around, we can say um, starting with a fundamental theory, we can integrate out high energy or higher energy degrees of freedom to get effective field theories. Okay? This is basically taking this story and going this way. This is saying, yeah, this is our fundamental description, but if we're going to restrict ourselves to the case where the momentum is small compared to that big-ass exchange particle, then we can basically integrate that out. Now integrate out is not just simply just integrating it out, but it's, it's basically removing it. And we get this effective description. Okay? Now, um, I want, so everything I'm talking about is field theory. I want you to be aware though that this scheme and this approach due to Wilson is so broad that it applies you know, outside of field theory to field theory, effective theories. So for example, if I take you know, some atomic thing where everything is discrete, and then 
you're going to take a lot of it, a hell of a lot of it. I can take this discrete system and I can replace it by a filter. Don't you love the way I'm writing now? It's like, I'm trying to do it. It's obviously, this is obviously discrete. You guys know it. I don't know what I'm doing, but anyway. Uh, so, yeah, you can, t I mean, we, don't we do this all the freaking time? I mean, water. Who does water on its molecular level? Not me. That's a fluid. Okay, I describe it as a fluid. I got all these cool fluid terms. Pressure. Oh. Okay. Well, I mean, this is an effective field theory. So you can get effective field theory descriptions even if your starting point is something which is not at all and if a field theory, if it's not a field theory, okay? Moreover, if I work in this theory, I'll find this theory is non renormalizable and the infinities pop up when I am operating at energy scales associated with that length. As long as I'm describing things in terms of energy levels much larger than this length, this is a good description. But if I go down to scales on the order of the discrete nature of this, this description is going to blow up. Okay? The same thing with this story. Okay? This works as long as you're using your energy levels smaller than the mass of this particle. Okay? Does that make sense? All right, well, now we have it. We have Wilson's approach to renormalization in terms of effective field theories, which tells us if we have a non-renormalizable theory, then really we should appreciate that non-renormalizable theory as an effective theory, which should have a UV replacement at higher energy. Quantum gravity is non renormalizable. That's what I told you. You get infinities that won't go away. Okay. According to Wilson, what this is saying is quantum gravity is just an effective description it should be replaced by something else at high enough energies. Well, in the same sense that here, the distance here or the energy scale associated with this distance tells you the blow up of this, you might wonder, well, when is this effective field theory gonna blow up? When does this have to be replaced by its ultraviolet completion? Well, it turns out to get that, we just look at a couple of scales we can look at the Planck mass scale. And all of these are just combinations of the three fundamental constants, H bar C and capital G, where that's the gravitational constant. Um, 10 to the minus eight kilogram. Okay, that's pretty light, right? Pretty light. It's actually hella huge, uh, because we're talking about particles here. And if I just compare it with some of the biggest particles, like the weak bosons, these are 10 to the minus 25 kilograms. So in terms of the scales associated with particle physics, this is hella huge. But if you want to know the energy associated with that, well, we just take M Planck times C squared. This is going to be 10 to the 19 GeV. And if you would like to know the length associated with that, this is going to be root h bar g over c cubed. It's going to be 10 to the minus 35 meters. Okay? So if you're dealing with a mass at the particular, at the particle level that's huge, or just an energy scale that's huge, or a length scale which is super tiny, 
In all three of these cases, where they're all they're degenerate, okay, if you're gonna go here, you're gonna be here and here, you cannot use the quantum gravity field theory to do your calculations. You won't get anything near the right answer. You have to replace it with its ultraviolet completion. Well, hang on. I mean, do these things exist? I mean, is there a situation where all of these are actually relevant? Unless you're experiencing this, okay, as the parameters of what you're looking at, you can use the effective quantum gravity formulation. And you're just gonna get normal, nice answers. Because you, you don't have to deal with those infinities. Okay? However, if you meet these criteria, you're going to encounter those infinities. Can anybody tell me under what circumstances you meet these? Black holes can possibly be because if there has to be something else, they can. Yeah, exactly. Those are two important ingredients in the story of gravity. We know that black holes exist. We know the black holes exist, and we're pretty sure there was a Big Bang. Both of those hit this. If there were no black holes in nature, and if our universe was just static, it, it never had a Big Bang, then there's a possibility that these conditions are never physically met. So quantum gravity might just work, because if you, if you can't go this high, it doesn't matter. But you can go this high black holes and the Big Bang, okay? So the question is, what UV completion can we use? All right, it's a little weird. It's a little weird, honestly. We'll pretend last Thursday didn't happen. <laughs> Actually, that's my first answer, is loop quantum gravity. <laughs> so loop quantum gravity is one method, okay? Um, and loop quantum gravity is, is basically a somewhat different formulation of gravity, okay? which actually survives the quantization scheme, okay? That is, it's a minimalist approach. It's just saying, I wanna take gravity in its normal formulation in terms of general relativity where quantization doesn't work, and I wanna change it just enough so that the quantization works. So that's what we might often call a phenomenological approach. It's, it's kind of interesting, but boring. <laughs> It's a subfield. There's definitely people that do this. Carlo Rovelli is one of their leaders. Um, and if you want to hear about, how many of you know about Sean Carroll's podcast, Mindscape? So Sean Carroll, he's the guy who writes the book I use for my general relativity class. And he, anyway, I've met him a couple of times. But anyway, um, he has a podcast. And he's sort of a general relativist slash string theorist you know, kind of person, but he does these podcasts where he brings on guests that discuss all these various things. And it's kind of kept at sort of a low level. Uh, but anyway, one of his first guests was Carlo Rovelli. So we had a, a loop quantum gravity person versus a string theory person in this discussion. It was kind of cute. But anyway, they, they treated each other very respectfully. But if you listen to that, you'll kind of hear Carlo Rovelli kind of explain loop quantum gravity. I've never been that interested in it. It's just kind of just been by the wayside for a good reason. If you do this, you're only solving one problem. That's the quantum problem with gravity. There are many other problems in the standard model that have to be fixed. Okay. Moreover, this is not predicting gravity. This is starting with gravity and just changing it so that you can quantize it. All right. This does not bring in supersymmetry. Okay. Now, um, if I needed a second alternative, what do you think I might use? Band theory. <laughs> oh, look, Drew is on 
top. Drew. <laughs> what is it? String theory. String theory. String theory. Okay. Now, I, I actually have these notes written up as if I did not give you a lecture on the string theory. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just finish with a couple of comments. Um, and this was actually the, the last point that I did not get to make in our string theory lecture because we were kind of running out of time. Remember when I said that if you take an effective field theory and you give it its UV completion, the effective field theory is non-renormalizable. Okay? However, the ultraviolet completion could be renormalizable or it could just be finite. String theory is finite. Now, you might wonder, how the hell does a theory become finite? Well, here's the, here's the simple observation. A lot of the idea of infinity comes from taking the distance over which you're looking at something to next to zero, okay? Remember, momentum is inversely proportional to one over the length scale. So if I were to go to really high momentum, I gotta go to a really small length scale. String theory provides you with a fundamental length scale but below which you can't go. It doesn't mean anything to try and talk about length scales smaller than the length of a string. If you could, then string theory would be actually an effective field theory of this. No, no, it's, this is the fundamental length, and it's not zero. So that means that the p can't go to infinity. It's cut off. So there are no infinities in string theory. It's finite. OK? Better still, and I'm going to give you a little explanation on this, it contains supersymmetry. Let me give you a interesting advantage to having supersymmetry, which loop quantum gravity doesn't have. So by now, and I would have showed you this in the string theory lecture, except I hadn't told you about renormalization. Now that I've told you about renormalization, I can, tell you, tell you, I can explain this point to you. If I consider how the couplings in the standard model change as I change energy scales, so now this is the renormalization of the coupling. So we have G1, G2, and G3, where G1 is the um, Actually, G1 is going to be the electromagnetic, G2 is going to be the uh, weak, and G3 is going to be uh, the strong. At any rate, they're going to go like this. Remember, this is G1, G2, G3. Okay? So these two couplings, well, they cross there. And there's a certain point where you might say, well, you know, if they cross there, then maybe these two couplings become the same value. That's a point where you could unify those interactions into a single, and this is actually the electromagnetic and the weak interactions, and we know they're unified. However, the strong interaction coupling does not meet at the same point. So there's no sense in which we could take all three of those forces and say, at a certain energy scale, all of your couplings have the same value, therefore, there's only one coupling, and it's of a larger gauge group. That is, it's a gut, okay? However, if we add a little Susie, this picture changes. If you add supersymmetry to the theory, it's obviously going to impact the way that things flow under renormalization because you get more diagrams, you've got more particles, you've got super partners, but don't worry about the details of that. What's important though is that these couplings, their renormalization converges to a single point, which makes it a much better candidate for a gut. That is SU3 cross SU2 left cross U1 hypercharge could be realized in terms of maybe an SO10 or an SU5. That is, these are all going to unify into a single gauge group which only has one coupling. If these are all coming from this, this only has one coupling. 
fact that we have three different couplings is just the breaking of this symmetry down into these subgroups. So the fact that string theory has supersymmetry, well, first of all, it provides us with this coupling unification. But then, does anybody know what kind of gauge groups we get out of string theory? Does anybody remember? SO32 or E8 cross E8. Groups with 496 generators. These are plenty large enough to give us the standard model groups. Okay? All right. That's the end of it. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, yeah, I was going to say that string theory is awesome, but I don't think I need to sell it. I did that on Thursday, so. Um, but at any rate, so. So hopefully, I mean, I, I know I, I kind of gave up on doing calculations and just want to tell you a story, but this story is so broad in its application that if I only did calculations, you might think, well, that story only plays out in that. But no, it plays out in many, many different regimes, okay? And, you know, this, this Wilsonian approach to non or to renormalization in general is basically, I'll reiterate this, if you're working with an effective field theory and it has infinite, infinities, what that's telling you is that your effective field theory is only valid up to a certain scale, and beyond that, it should be replaced by its ultraviolet completion. And it might be that, and honestly, this is the way it, it probably is, it might be that you replace it with another theory, and that theory is only good up to a certain energy, and then you have to replace it by another theory, okay? That's fine. All right. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Sorry, it's kind of like a down ending, but <laughs> I would have ended with my string theory lecture, but you guys wanted that for eBay, so I gave it to you. Yes? Why do they call it ultraviolet completion? Ultraviolet? Are you oh, it's, just, it's just on the high energy end. That's, that's just, it's not technically ultraviolet, but it's just the high energy end of the spectrum. Yeah, so I'm not I'm not super familiar with twisters. Um, they were so I will say this about string theory. This is something which I think I have not said that I should say. Um, one thing that is perhaps amazing about string. So first of all, like, like I told you, string theory is a closed set of ideas. You can't just throw arbitrary shit into string theory. You can't say, oh, let's do string theory in 48 dimensions. That's not allowed. Okay. Let's add in some extra particles. Let's make some gauge, you know, these gauge groups are the only ones you can work with. You can break these down to smaller things, but you can't put in bigger gauge groups, okay? Twisters actually come out of string theory. I, I, I can't, so there's a, there's a calculation that Ed Witten did. He's the smart guy that put everything together. There's a calculation that he did for strings, and he actually realized that you could take that entire story and translate it over to the language of twisters. But I really don't, remember what twisters are about. I looked at them very briefly and then I just let them go, okay? But here's, here's what I want to tell you about this connection. String theory, you might or might not think that it is the fundamental theory of everything. We can't prove it. We can't do an experiment and prove that string theory even exists. However, string theory is a way of formulating anything in physics. You can take pretty much any physical system you're working on and you can embed it in string theory. You can obviously take gauge theory, gauge field theory and embed it in string theory. But you can also do like discrete systems. You can embed those in string theory, okay? Through a network of D0 brains and it's, it's really interesting. So my point though is that string theory is almost a new language for doing physics which provides us with a lot of very, very powerful tools which are not at our disposal if we're not doing string theory as the embedding, okay? So once again, you know, there, there's, I talked about the T-duality last time, or in the string lecture, where I said, you know, if you have a particle that's on a string, or on a, on a loop of radius r, and then you try and replace that with a loop of one over r, particles themselves are not gonna, they're gonna be different, because your momentum is, basically n over r. 
However, strings can wind around this. And so for strings, it turns out, you can put it on a circular radius r, you can put it on a circular one over r. It's the same theory, it doesn't care. So it's invariant under r goes to one over r. That's called t-duality. Well, there is another duality in strings called gs goes to one over gs. That is the coupling goes to one over the coupling. If you think about it, this is the coupling. We can use perturbation theory as long as this is small. If we take it to be big, we can't use perturbation theory because the subsequent terms, in, they, they have a bigger and bigger impact. However, in string theory, there is a duality called S-duality where you take the coupling in one description and it becomes one over the coupling in an alternative dual description. Well, if this is not tractable, this certainly is. If this is super huge, this is super small. You can use perturbation theory here. Okay? This is just one more of the important tools that comes out of string theory, which you would not imagine if you weren't embedding the system in the string theory and using string theory's tools. So I say this to you because right now there's a lot of, there was for many years a lot of like, it's not, you know, you can't do experiments, that's bullshit, da da da. Now what people are finally opening up to is, okay, wait, this is just a new way to do physics. I can just, I can sit and work on a physics that's not quantum gravity or anything. I just talk about, you know, chemicals in a, you know, in, in a matrix or something like that. If I embed it in string theory, there are some calculations which I couldn't do, which I can now do trivially. Okay, so string theory is providing us with these tools. So for example, in string theory, and I won't, you know, go into detail about it, but one of the biggest discoveries was by Juan Valdesini, who I showed you in my slides, but the ADS-CFT correspondence is basically, this is a conformal quantum field theory. It's, it's a quantum field theory, it happens to be conformal. This is gravity in anti-de-sitter space, and it turns out that this is an S-duality. So if this is strongly, if this is strongly coupled, this is weakly coupled. But this is doing pure gravity calculations versus quantum field theory calculations. But if you do one, you can map it to the answers of the other. This has been taken by storm because there's plenty of people that see the value in this even though they don't like to think of string theory. This was born in string theory, okay? As have many other ideas. Yes? Uh, does the string theory explain, for example, bar model of energy? It, it, it could, it could. So the, the problem is that you're talking about problems which are, so if we could take string theory and we could extract the standard model out of it, okay, then, um, then we could say, okay, we got the standard model, we've got gravity, we need dark matter, and then you could probably find where in string theory the dark matter, the dark energy comes from. The problem is taking string theory and getting the standard model out of it. That's, it hasn't been done. Or rather, it's been done too many times to really know what the answer is. So unfortunately, at this point, we're not really under the, we're not really under the string theory is providing us with a solution for dark energy. Dark, it provides us with candidates, but we can't show that those candidates are the definitive answer at this point. Maybe in the future, but not right now. It's like, like there's, a, there's the cosmological constant problem. This is the, 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 the cosmological constant, its theorized value is 120 orders of magnitude larger than the actual value that we see. That's a huge fucking problem. Okay. It's one of the biggest in theoretical physics, okay? String theory provides you with scenarios that address that. They're called D-brain, or they're called brain worlds. So it's basically, and I, my first research paper was on this. If I am in 5D, and these are 4D D-brains. Oops, 4D. <laughs> okay. We live on one of these D-brains. That's the one plus three dimensions that we live in. However, if I have another D-brain over here, which is separated from me by like a few millimeters, then this D-brain can explain why the cosmological constant is as small as it is, even though its predicted value should be much larger. But that's a prediction based on just quantum field theory. If I look at it in this context of string theory, 
then that resolves it. However, we can't say that string theory predicts this to happen. It's just a possibility in string theory. There's a, I mean, you know, predictions are, here's a set of parameters, predict what's gonna happen. String theory has a boatload of possibilities, and we have been able to narrow them down here. Other questions? Uh, oh, shoot, sorry. Uh, sorry I kept you so long, folks. Thank you so much for a great semester. I really enjoyed it. And uh, once again, I will be.